Welcome to our 15th uh, virtual meeting in our February Family Community Meeting Series of 2021. Thank you all for being here. Welcome. It's great to see all your uh, or some of your smiling faces and many of your names uh, this time as we have Dr. Eric Wallace talking about adjunct therapies uh, for kidney health, an important topic to the February community. And as usual, our my uh, trusty co-host Dawn is here with us. And uh, oh, I do still have this hanging up here to uh, kind of guide me. So as you know, we all know Dawn, or, or most of us know Dawn very well, but I still use a little cheat sheet just to make sure I don't get, uh, get mixed up as we introduce her. So John, Dawn is a genetic counselor, a um, certified genetic counselor with a master's degree from Emory University Medical Center. And Dawn is, uh, there's so many programs that Dawn is involved in, but I'll read the highlights of her, her job, um, things about her job first and then some of the others. So officially, Dawn is the, uh, an assistant professor, clinical researcher, program leader of the Lysosomal Storage Disease Center, and director of the Genetic Clinical Trial Center in the Department of Human Genetics at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. We all know that, but I couldn't have said it like uh, as efficiently without my cheat sheet. So uh, welcome Dawn again. Dawn also, um, she's been focused on her clinical interests and her program interests on Fabry for many, many years, as many years as I've been in the program uh, when I started in 2002. And I'm not sure if she started right around that time or earlier, but she's got a lot of experience. And so Dawn is also the co-founder of Think Genetic, and uh, she also enjoys writing uh, children's books, and she's published as the first author or co-author of many uh, Fabrizio's journal articles. So welcome, Dawn. Dawn is going to formally introduce uh, Dr. Wallace for us, and Dr. Wallace is uh, also one of our resident experts in Fabry disease and does so much. Uh, and we've um, just been talking about this this week, that Dr. Wallace is not only the primary attending uh, or primary Fabry physician in Alabama, from a UAB and, and does telehealth in Alabama. He's also doing telehealth in other states now. So you can reach uh, Dr. Wallace from going on our Find a Specialist database on our website and select um, Alabama first. You'll see his name and as the, his regular clinical practice. And then if you look in Florida, uh, Mississippi, and soon Tennessee, you'll also see Dr. Wallace as a statewide telehealth provider. So if you have needs in those states, uh, you know where to find Dr. Wallace by going on our telehealth uh, for our find a specialist database and looking up his contact information. So that is a great benefit to the Fabric community that he is expanding and uh, giving uh, people who don't have a, a good contact to a Fabric expert uh, an opportunity to do so. So uh, welcome Dr. Wallace and Dawn is going to uh, formally announce you. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, it's, it's very exciting to yet again get to introduce Dr. Eric Wallace. He is my next door neighbor over here in Alabama to Georgia. Uh, we share several families of patients uh, in his role as an associate professor um, in nephrology over there at University of Alabama at Birmingham. He also, as you might expect from his great uh, expansion in telemedicine is the medical director of telehealth over there and the co-director of home dialysis and UAB home dialysis. Um, but he really has spent a lot of good quality time learning more about Fabry disease, really being in the advocacy realm and, you know, is my go-to guy whenever we're talking about kidney stuff and Fabry, which uh, benefits, I think, all of our patients. So I'm really excited to hear about adjunct ther therapies today. So I will take it away and send it to you. All right. Well, uh, I, I think uh, Don is a certified nephrologist, so she doesn't need me too much. Um, so let's see. All right. So can you guys see my screen? Yes. Me... All right. Here. All right. Let me get the chat box up just in case. There's the chat box. All right. So we're going to talk, um, actually, you know, the, the fun part about Fabry disease is that there's a whole lot of new stuff coming out um, and new data on old, um, uh, on old therapies too. So, you know, I get to present two new studies that are um, out today, but 
<clears throat> but I want to talk a little bit of just about Fabry and the kidney and kind of level set. I always start with the, the basics because I find that uh, even I need a review on the basics uh, sometimes. So um, these are, you, you know, uh, these are all my disclosures, uh, pretty much any company that's doing research for Febre disease, I'm happy to work with. So uh, it's a long list. Um, so the objectives of this, we're going to talk about, you know, just the kidney in general, you know, how it works, how do we measure the effects of Febre, um, what the kidney can tell us about Febre disease, and then finally, we'll talk about the therapies. And so that, that's, that's really important. And there's, there's therapies that are directed directly at Febre disease, and then there's therapies that are just standard kidney disease therapies. Um, so you guys have probably all seen this, which is that um, Febre disease stems from a uh, genetic defect in an enzyme called alpha-galactosidase. Um, and so think of this, this enzyme uh, as the, the, the trash man, right? So basically your cell, uh, each individual cell makes trash. Um, it's like a factory. Um, lots of parallels can be made about cells and factories, uh, but this is the trash. So the trash goes to the, to the trash man and the trash man has to take out the trash, right? Um, and so the way they do that is this thing called lysosome, right? So inside the lysosome, trash gets targeted there and this enzyme breaks it down. And then the trash gets exported outside of the cell um, uh, in these lipid particles, and then uh, you, you excrete them. So if you don't have a trash man, what happens? Well, from birth, and we know this happens from birth, uh, GB3 or the trash, globotriacylceramide builds up. As it builds up, the cell doesn't work that well. And as the cell doesn't work that well, now you get uh, a tissue disease. And I say tissue because it happens in every cell in your body. Um, so there's not really cells that Fabre spares uh, pretty much. It's, it's everywhere. Kidney just happens to be one of them. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of how, how I got here. So the sum total of all of these cellular dysfunctions uh, leads to tissue and tissue is what makes organs. When organs don't work very well, they fail. All right. So, so why is the kidney important? So you know, the kidney actually is there to restore balance. I mean, that's really what the kidney does. Um, really what it does is it takes all the crap that we put into our body um, and gets rid of the bad stuff and holds on to the good stuff. Um, you know, the liver is kind of similar uh, where we put a lot of bad stuff into our bodies and we need some organs to just say what in this is good and what is bad. And that's what the liver and kidney do. All right. So what is the bad stuff we can put in our body? Well, you know, one is toxins. Um, some of that is stuff that we put in our mouths that we don't need. Um, you know, too much sugar, too much um, uh, potassium, sodium, et cetera. The kidney just says, what do I need? And pees out the rest. Uh, water actually can be a toxin. So if I didn't have kidneys, um, let's say I wasn't urinating and I drank 10 liters of water. Well, where does that water go? Um, it just builds up. First, you start to swell and then it goes into your lungs and eventually you drown. So um, if you don't have a way to remove it. So water can actually be a significant toxin um, when you don't have kidney function, but it's very good when you do have kidney function to flush the body. Right. So I don't want to say don't drink water. It's just when you don't have kidney function, water can be a toxin. All right. Uh, it does some other stuff too. It regulates blood counts. Um, so as the kidneys fail, the kidney is kind of the master organ that decides when the bone marrow needs to make blood. So the, the kidney is the foreman, um, whereas the bone marrow is the workers, right? So if the kidney senses that there's not enough oxygen being delivered to it, it tells the bone marrow to make blood. Well, if your kidneys aren't working, guess what? That signal doesn't get there. Bone marrow doesn't make enough blood and people get very anemic, uh, so low blood counts, and that, that causes fatigue and people don't feel good. Uh, it regulates bone metabolism, so you know, most people don't you know, attribute kidney disease to bones, but it absolutely does through the regulation of vitamin D. Um, so you know, we all have this form of vitamin D that's what's called nutritional vitamin D. That's the nutrition, that's the vitamin D that we, we get from, you know, drinking fortified milk, uh, with vitamin D. We, we started putting vitamin D in a whole lot of stuff and by, by going out in the sun. But what most people don't know is that vitamin D really doesn't do a whole lot. Um, now, you know, that, that's a little bit debatable depending on which studies you read. Uh, but it, you know, for most people, it doesn't do a ton. But what it does do, it provides the raw material 
for the kidney to activate it. So this is the raw material, that nutritional vitamin D that we all worry about, but it's the kidney that decides how much of this stuff do I need to be active, right? It's active vitamin D that helps you absorb calcium um, and absorbing calcium uh, long-term through a lot of different effects on the what's called the parathyroid gland affects the bones. And then finally, it regulates blood pressure through something called the renin-angiotensin system. So, you know, kidney does a lot. Um, now, I'm clearly biased as a nephrologist, but you know, I like to call it the master organ. Um, I think the neurologists and cardiologists kind of disagree with me. But um, So how does it work? I mean, how does it do all this stuff? And it turns out it's, it's really not that complicated. Um, it's, it's just a filter, right? Uh, and so for any of you who have uh, uh, tried to work with a pool filter, it's the same principles, which is that on the one hand, you have, uh, this is pool water going uh, in to the filter. Actually, this would be the pool water going into the filter, right? Um, that's the dirty water that, that goes there uh, through something called the renal artery. So that delivers dirty water to the filter. Then it goes through the filtration system, right? And clean blood goes back to the pool. Now the dirty blood that or the dirty stuff that comes out of the filter goes through this little pipe called the uh, backwash, which is just like your urine. I mean, it's the same principle, exact same principle as a pool filter, right? So just like a pool filter, if the pool is clean or if the filter is working, the pool looks like this, which is where we all wanna be right now. If the pool filter isn't working, well, guess what? The, the, the pool, in this case, your blood looks like the bottom and people feel bad and they get something called uremia, which is this buildup of toxins that causes people to have this bad taste in their mouth. They have nausea, vomiting. They, they can't really, um, uh, it, it causes alteration in the sleep cycle. Eventually you get foggy headed. And if, you know, prior to the onset of, when I say onset, Prior to us having dialysis as a widespread modality for people, which was uh, really the late 1960s, um, when Richard Nixon actually signed the ESRD uh, bill into uh, law, uh, people would die because they needed these toxins removed and they couldn't have it. Now, luckily, now we have dialysis and we can um, uh, largely uh, fix this. But preventing this is preventing the kidneys failing is really what we try and do. Right. So this is just another picture of how the kidney works, which is uh, on the left here. You can see the blue is the renal artery that takes clean blood right to the um, uh, to the there, sorry, dirty blood to the kidney. Uh, it gets filtered. The blue is the renal vein that brings it back into circulation. Um, and uh, uh, and then the ureter is the backwash. Right. Uh, so that's that's the correlator. Now. That's the big kidney, but what actually, what does the filter itself looks like? And it turns out inside the kidney, there's about a million of these little filters called glomeruli. And all they are is little kidneys. I mean, it's crazy that our body evolved to have tiny little kidneys and they put all these tiny little kidneys together to form one big kidney. Um, but it, it's the exact same process where you have an uh, artery that brings clean or dirty blood to the um, uh, to the glomerulus on the right, which is just a sack of little capillaries. Uh, it goes through this filter, right? And we'll talk about the filter in just a minute. This is the backwash, which is uh, Bowman's capsule and the proximal tubule, which is where urine goes. And then the clean stuff goes back here, right? Um, so that's, that's how everything happens. And that's part of the clean stuff. There's another set of tubules or capillaries called the peritubular capillaries, um, that also bring clean blood and conditioned blood back um, into uh, 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 circulation. All right. So I said this is a filter, right? And so if anybody's worked with a filter, um, which we all should have in high school, um, which is basically a filter is a membrane, right? And so, and, you know, it's, it's a, it's something, it's a barrier. I mean, we all know our air filter, right? So our air filter, you have dirty air that goes through this mesh work of stuff. And then you get the clean air that circulates back into your house. That's, that's a filter. It's the same in the kidney. But what is the kidney filter made of, right? And it's made of three layers, right? So one of the layers is this fenestrated endothelium. And all that means is the blood cells, like the blood vessels that go there. Um, actually, it's just a pipe, right? But think about it as a pipe with little holes in it. So if you look at the top, see, here's a cell. And do you see this hole right here? 
Can you guys see my arrow? All right. So that's, that is a fenestration. That means there's a break in the pipe and it's designed that way so that it can be leaky. So you want a leaky pipe to, to start forcing fluid across something. Um, so the next layer here is this glomerular basement membrane, which is just this meshwork of uh, uh, collagen, uh, primarily type four collagen. And then you have these cells called the podocytes. And the podocytes are these, uh, poto means foot, site means cell. So these are these cells that have giant feet right? Like octopus um, or octopi. Um, anyway, these feet interdigitate. So they, they go like this and form a cuff that wraps around the entire artery or arteriole that is in the glomerulus, right? So those are the three layers. Now think about this as a sieve, right? So if I'm cooking my potatoes, right? I, I put the potatoes with water into my sieve, right? Now I want the water to come out but I want the potatoes to stay here. Well, that's kind of what the kidney does, which is that inside this capillary lumen, right? Uh, you want big stuff to stay inside there. And the big stuff here are protein and blood, right? So protein and blood, you want to stay here. On the other side is the sink, right? That's what you want smaller stuff and, and molecules to, to get through there. Um, so, if there is a problem, and one of the ways nephrologists work, which is if there's a problem with this filter, what do we do? We um, uh, Basically, we detect the big stuff in the urine, right? Because it made it through the sieve. Think about if a potato made it through your colander, right? Or your sieve, you'd, you'd start looking for the hole. Well, that's what nephrologists do. If we see protein in the urine, we say, wait a minute, there's a problem with the sieve. The sieve is composed of three parts, which is blood vessels, which Fabry affects, collagen, which Fabry doesn't affect too much except for the endothelial cells, the, the cells that line the capillary actually make the protein that is in between it. So it can affect it a little bit. And then the podocyte, which absolutely Fabry disease affects. So two layers of this sieve are affected with Fabry disease. All right. So how do we measure the effects of Fabry disease on the kidney? Well, the first thing is a creatinine. And, you know, creatinine was this gold standard molecule that um, we came about um, really in the 60s, and we have never found anything better. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on around with cystatin C, and don't get me wrong, it's great. Uh, but most places still just have not figured out, except in the exception, uh, that, that things are that much better than creatinine itself. All right, so it's an oldie but a goodie. So the creatinine value, every February patient should really know what their creatinine is. I, I think that you, know, you should go to your doc and say, what is my creatinine? Um, even more than the creatinine is what does that mean, right? So for instance, I'll give you an example. Uh, creatinine values, any normal is 0.8 to 1.2. Um, creatinine is made by muscle. So it's made by muscle at a constant rate and it is gotten rid of, it is, leaves the body at a constant rate by the kidney. So if the kidney shuts down, the creatinine in the blood levels rise such that every time your creatinine doubles, you've lost half your kidney function, okay? So sometimes we tell patients, oh, your creatinine is one. And they say, well, I don't, what does that mean, right? Um, and it's really hard to conceptualize. I don't know what a creatinine of one is. So what nephrologists did was they said, well, why don't we put this into equation and see what, what percent, what is the glomerular filtration rate? So that is the rate at which uh, there is a filtrate being created at the level of glomerulus. The better way to think about this, or the easy way to think about it is as a percent, right? And the reason we can think of this as a percent your kidney is working is because a normal GFR or glomerular filtration rate is about 120, right? Well, that's pretty close to 100. So it's kind of more, it's easier for me to help my patients conceptualize that if my kidney function is at 80, it's 80%. Now, it's really a little bit lower, but it's good enough for, for, uh, for most things, right? So the, the equations that we use, and this is where you got to be a, a smart consumer, right? Um, which is that the equation we use for to estimate your glomerular filtration rate or get that percent your kidney is working, uh, in most electronic medical record is something called the MDRD equation. Now the problem, it's a great equation, but the problem with it is that it is only valid 
when your kidney function is less than 60%, right? Now that's a real problem. Um, and the reason it's a real problem is that a lot of primary care docs will say, this is normal, this is normal, this is normal because your number will read greater than 60. Well, it's just gonna read greater than 60 until you're less than 60. But by the time you're less than 60, you've lost about 50% of your kidney function, right? So that's the problem. The, the other issue is that the equation, there is an equation that we have for patients who have kidney functions that are greater than 60, and it's called the CKD epi equation. But this is not integrated into most electronic medical records. So you're going to have to ask your doctor, what is my GFR? If they tell you it's quote unquote normal, don't accept that, right? You say, what is my number, right? Because you want to know if it's 70, 80, 90, and more importantly, you want to know, is it getting worse over time, okay? That's called the annualized slope of your kidney function. Is my kidney function getting worse? You don't want to know once it's, once it's 55. I want to know if my kidney went from 90 to 80, right? Um, but the, the, there's a real problem in how we deliver this that, that we're going to have to fix long term. Now, the other issue, the reason this is so important, it's even more important for females because females actually are at a, a distinct disadvantage here. And the reason is, is that females on average have lower muscle mass than men. Well, I just told you that creatinine is made by muscle, right? So the lower the muscle mass at baseline, the lower your creatinine will be, even if it's normal, all right? So for instance, if you take a bodybuilder, their creatinine may be 1.2, 1.3, right? And their kidney functions are stone cold normal. And that's great. And it's all because they have a lot of muscle, right? So they're normal at that high creatinine. On the other hand, um, uh, a female with very little muscle mass um, might have a normal kidney function with a baseline creatinine of 0 0.5, okay? So both of them have a GFR of 120. Bodybuilder has a creatinine 1.2, female has 1.5. Now here's the problem, because I just told you that every time your creatinine doubles, you've lost half your kidney function. Well, if your baseline creatinine is 0.5 and you go to 1.0, your kidney function is about 50%. Where at, the problem with that is that 1.0 is still in the normal range. It's in the normal range for, um, for kidney function. So nobody's going to notice it, right? Which is another reason you need to know what is your baseline and what is it doing over time and most, and that's, that's super important in everybody, but it's even more important in females because you'll actually lose a lot of kidney function by the time that value says high, right? Um, so I, I like to tell all my females, be very, very vigilant about this, all right? Now, the other thing is uh, protein in the urine, right? So um, you can check protein in the urine with a little urine dipstick, um, which has one plus, two plus, three plus, the problem is that doesn't really tell us a whole lot of information, right? Um, what really needs to be done is this urine protein, spot urine protein and spot urine creatinine. And that's just looking for holes in the, in the kidney, right? We're looking for the potato on the other side of the colander to see if there's issues going on, all right? Um, there are some studies that use podocytes in the urine as a marker, but those are only in the study world, not in uh, the clinical realm. So here's the thing, which is that, you know, most people are on the, the tail end of this spectrum. So what's the average age of diagnosis for a Fabre patient? It's about 27. Um, so, it, you know, it used to, it's actually gotten a little bit lower, and that's primarily based on family screening that we've been able to lower that number. Uh, it used to be the average age was around 35, 36. So, but the problem is, is what happens first? So how do patients get diagnosed in kidney land, right? So patients who are diagnosed by a nephrologist are diagnosed because they have a lot of protein in the urine, right? So what happens is they lose kidney function, they have protein in the urine, they get referred and we say, oh, it's just a little protein in your kidneys normal, right? And then they develop more and more protein. And finally we say, well, maybe we should biopsy you and lo and behold, you have Fabry disease because we can see it on the kidney biopsy. But it turns out that's really late. 
So what you'll see is you'll see GL3 deposits first in podocytes. So you know these these deposits start building up um, uh, you know, really really young in age, and they'll start building up in the podocyte itself. They'll build up in every cell in the kidney, but in the podocyte for sure. So then what happens is you'll get foot process effacement. So the the foot processes as they get sick, these octopi cells that are wrapping around your 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 capillaries in the glomerulus get sick and they flatten out. Right, um, and it's a it's it's very characteristic that you can see these these foot processes get sick. Then you get the protein in the urine, and then you get kidney function that declines. So by the time you get to a point where a nephrologist says, "Hey, maybe I should biopsy, or maybe I should maybe you have Fabry disease," uh, the cat's out of the bag. I mean, you've already you've already had foot process effacement, you've had podocyte loss, etc. All right. So we need to get on the front end of this curve in diagnosing. Um, we have shown that uh, the earlier you start patients uh, uh, on some sort of therapy, the better they do uh, in general. So that that uh, has now been been shown. All right. So we want to get on the front end of that, not wait till you have disease and try and reverse it. Because one thing that's uh, pretty universal about the human body is that the human body is not very good at reversing things. Like you, medicine is pretty good at at taking what you give it and then keeping it steady, but very rarely do you get you back to you know the 18 year old self prior to proteinuria. But if we catch it early, then we can treat and and hopefully prevent uh, declining kidney function. So now you know a lot of things is what is a how do we measure the kidney? But the another version of this is well, what can the kidney biopsy tell us about Fabry disease, right? Um, so. Usually when people start getting, uh, you know, I'm a nephrologist, so we do kidney biopsies. Um, but usually what a kidney biopsy can tell us, well, let's, let's talk about the, the biopsy itself, right? Um, so the biopsy itself, um, oh, the biopsy itself is a, um, uh, it's not a risk-free procedure, right? So you really want to know that you're going to get some good information uh, if you do a kidney biopsy. The procedure itself uh, we have patients lay on their stomach because the kidney's on their back and we need to get to the back. Um, the kidney's only about that far down, um, depending on the habitus of the patient, but it's really not that far from your back. So we ultrasound, we say, which one is the easiest to get to? Most patients are born with two kidneys, not everybody, but most patients are born with two. And we don't tell you which one we're going to go for. We just say, all right, I'm going to go for the easiest to get to, all right? Because whatever's happening in one is happening in the other. Then what we do is we numb you up, we take the ultrasound and advance the needle, you can see the needle, all the way to the kidney. The kidney's about the size of your fist. And then we, we say, all right, on the count of three, hold your breath. And we take the biopsy needle, we press a button, it goes in and out of your kidney in a millisecond and it gets a piece of kidney that is about the size of the tip of this pen, right? We do it two or three times and we get all the tissue that we need. Now. The reason we, you're awake for this, and the reason you're awake is because every time you breathe, this kidney moves, right? We don't like to hit a moving target. So we have you hold your breath, we hit the button, we take a piece. Now, that's the procedure itself. So the benefits are we get to understand exactly what's happening to your kidney um, uh, with Fabry disease, right? Um, in some patients with Fabry disease, we might suspect that there's something more going on. Uh, there's about five case reports of, of folks that, yes, they had Fabry disease, but after we biopsied them, they, they had something on top of Fabry disease. Um, Fabry disease is rare, kidney disease is not. Um, so it is not surprising that people can have two diseases going on in their kidney. Um, so lupus, for instance, um, you know, lupus and uh, Fabry disease or membranous nephropathy and Fabry disease. Diabetes and Fabry disease is not that uncommon. So anyway, we need to figure out what is the contribution of Fabry disease to your kidney, knowing that there's other things that could be uh, contributing, right? Um, so the other benefit is to patients who have variants. Uh, so right now, every time you do a genetic test, we learn of a new variant and lots of them we've never seen before. And we have to say, well, what is this variant doing to this patient, right? Um, and so in that case, a kidney biopsy may tell us, is this variant something we need to be worried about or is it nothing, right? I mean, if the kidney biopsy is pretty clear, then we say, yeah, this is a variant of unknown significance, but it, for you, it doesn't mean much because your kidney biopsy is clear, all right? So 
The so there's a lot of benefits to doing the biopsy, but there's risks. So you you for yourself have to weigh the risk and benefits. The risks of the the kidney biopsy are really bleeding. I mean, so the kidney filters blood. So guess what? There's a ton of blood going through each kidney every minute, and it turns out it gets about one fifth of the cardiac output. Um, and the cardiac output is about six liters a minute. So it gets one liter a minute to the kidneys, split that in two, each kidney gets half a liter per minute of blood, right? And it's just a sack of blood vessels. So if I stick a pinhole in a sack that's full of blood vessels, what do you think the problems that can happen? It's all bleeding, right? Almost every one of our complications with kidney biopsy is bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. So everybody's going to have a little blood in their urine right? That actually just means we got kidney. You're going to have a little blood in the urine for a little bit, but it'll clear up. But we found at UAB about one in 500 um, will bleed to the point of needing a blood transfusion, right? Now, that's, that's not nothing. But when we look back at our data, all of the patients who needed a blood transfusion started with a very low blood count. So, you know, I just told you kidney disease regulates blood. So if you have severe kidney disease, there is a high likelihood that you're anemic. Well, if you start with a blood count of that's really low and you bleed a little bit, it doesn't take much bleeding for you to need a blood transfusion. If you start with a blood count that's really high and you bleed a little bit, you're not going to need a blood transfusion. So it, it's not a shock that almost all of our complications happened in patients who had low blood counts to start, right? Um, the other thing is there has been some data that, that patients, as they get kidney disease, get hardening of their arteries. Well, if you stick a, a needle into a blood vessel, you want it to retract on itself so it stops the bleeding, right? Um, but if it's all hardened, it doesn't retract on itself. So once again, the, the risks are actually lower if you biopsy early than if you biopsy late, because that, that actually can increase your risk of complications. So anyway... So that's the kidney biopsy. So what, why would I get a kidney biopsy? Well, first of all, it can tell us the significance of a variant or late onset mutations. Females are very, very difficult, even with classic mutations on who to treat. And we have sets of sisters, same mutation. One sister kidney biopsy is clear, one sister not clear, right? So it can help us in females telling us who needs treatment, but even potentially when to treat, right? So maybe for the patient who has a clear kidney biopsy, I say, you know, why don't we follow you once a year, but maybe you don't need treatment immediately, right? On the other hand, if you have a full kidney biopsy, even if you're asymptomatic, we say, look, this is the time to treat right now. So there's a lot of data that we can get from, um, from kidney biopsies. It can also tell us scarring and prognosis. So if you have uh, more than 50% of your kidney that's scarred, that's not good news. That means that we're not going to get that part of your kidney back. Um, and then uh, from a practical standpoint, insurance companies want to make sure that you have disease that needs treatment. The, the drugs that are used to uh, treat these diseases are not expensive. So we had one drug company that actually, or not drug company, one uh, insurance company that stopped four of our females uh, on their therapy because they said, we need more proof. And I said, I got proof. I got a kidney biopsy. And so I showed them the kidney biopsy and they reinstated every one of our, our patients' uh, therapy. But otherwise, we would have had nothing to uh, lie back on, uh, specifically this drop in LysoGL3. Um, so a lot of uh, insurance companies are resting their head that LysoGL3 has to go down. And if it doesn't go down, well, it's not working. Problem is, I mean, it kind of makes sense, but it doesn't because in females, they all start with very, very low LISO GL3s. So if you start with a near normal LISO, it's almost impossible to show that the LISO got better. But we have females with almost normal LISO GL3s and they still have significant disease. All right. All right. When you do a kidney biopsy, this is what you see. You see these uh, on the left hand side all of these little striped circles um, uh, should not be there, right? And you might hear somebody call zebra bodies. Uh, these are, these are, they're lamellated. So it's, it, it looks like an onion. I mean, it works like an onion. So meaning that if I slice an onion this way, it's going to look like a zebra body because you'll just see the stripes this way. If I slice an onion this way, it's going to look like concentric circles and you're going to get a whirl, right? Like this one. So this is a zebra body. This is a whirl. So those shouldn't be there. 
Um, and they're in every cell. I mean, you can see them over here, over here, over here, um, and there's a lot of them, all right? So just an example, uh, a 31 year old female with a family history of Fabry disease presents for evaluation. She complains of mild pain in hands and feet, but it's really mild. Other things cause neuropathy. Um, she denies angiokeratoma, so she doesn't have any other skin lesions. She sweats, no GI symptom. I mean, she was doing pretty darn good. And so, you know, some people would say, should I treat this patient? I mean, yeah, she has a mutation, but does that mean she needs to go on therapy right now? Uh, we identified a class of mutation. So we knew she had a class of mutation, but that can be, that doesn't matter in females because some females, even with classic mutations, won't have many symptoms because of lionization of the X chromosome. All right. So we did full baseline evaluation. So we do everything before the kidney biopsy. We don't want to be invasive unless we have to. Cardiac MRI, normal. MRI brain, normal. Everything was normal, right? On our serologic and uh, radiographic um, um, uh, evaluation, right? Kidney function is normal, right? So we did a CKD epi, it's 99. 24 al albumin, she has no proteinuria. I mean, this looks like a patient that you'd say, why would I offer treatment? She looks great. So we do a kidney biopsy and this is one of the worst kidney biopsies I've seen in a female, right? Um, meaning that it is just chocker block full. All these little pink things are those whirls. So guess what? We start her on therapy um, and, uh, and she has been on therapy now for about six or seven years. But you can see that the serologic picture, the, these, these things that we see are late manifestations. Like if you, if you really, now had she had left ventricular hypertrophy, so her, if her heart was big or if she had tons of proteinuria, right? We probably would have just started her on therapy. But in the oligosymptomatic female who everything is normal, those are patients I worry about too, because those are the patients um, that, that could look like this and this kind of terrified them. All right. So, so the reason that females are all different is because of this lionization of the X chromosome. So females have two X's, right? And you don't need two X's. You, you only need one. Um, and so what each cell does on its own is it says, well, I'm going to use this X versus X X because as a female, you get one X from dad, one X from mom. Um, well, you only use one of those X's. So if you're a female and 80% of your cells chose the Fabre X chromosome, you're going to look like, you're going to look as severe as a male. On the other hand, if you're a, a patient who, um, whose cells chose 80% of the non Fabre chromosome, you're not going to have many symptoms. That you cannot tell uh, with pretty much any test that we have. You need to figure out what is going on at the level of the tissue. All right. So now let's talk about how I can keep my kidney function stable. So this is a paper that, um, that I wrote with, you know, kind of the, the pipeline for February disease. Um, so, and I like to do things, I'm, you know, docs are more like mechanics. So it's better to look at things as checklists and as, as, as pathways and say, where can I intervene on all of these pathways? So over here, you say, well, in order to make alpha galactosidase, I need DNA, right? So what if I just change the DNA? right? So that's gene therapy. And it turns out there are four companies right now that are looking at gene therapy and Fabry disease. Um, so AbroBio is what's called an ex vivo uh, gene therapy, where they actually harvest uh, uh, bone marrow or what are called hematopoietic stem cells. They take them outside of your body. They infect those cells with what's called the lentivirus. They get that gene into those stem cells inject the stem cells back into you, those stem cells start making enzyme because they have the right code. Um, ST920 and um, uh, uh, FLT190, these are two separate companies uh, that are working on um, uh, adeno-associated virus-delivered uh, gene therapy. Um, they target the liver with the idea being as the liver is a big organ, it has lots of cells. So if I infect the liver, get those cells to uh, make enzyme. I can make a lot of it and fix the disease. And then finally, 4-DMT um, or 4-D molecular therapeutics is actually working on a cardiomyocyte target uh, adeno-associated virus um, gene therapy. So that's one, all right? 
So now once I get the DNA, so once I get the code, what your body does with it, it actually um, transcribes it into mRNA. So what if I could intervene at the level of mRNA? And with Moderna um, and with uh, Pfizer, the mRNA technologies have uh, come a long way, right? The acceptance of them have come a long way. So what if I just administered a bunch of alpha-galactosidase, mRNA, your body takes it up and then starts making mRNA. That's what we did with the COVID vaccine. The only problem with it, um, that there is actually one mouse model where they've done that. Um, uh, it seemed to be effective. Uh, the longevity of mRNA is not that long in general. Um, and so the question is, is, well, how many times a week would still be an IV infusion? How many times a week would I need to do this, right? Um, and would it be better than existing therapy? And we don't know. Uh, I can tell you that they are working on mRNA for other lysosomal storage disease. So, so more to follow there. All right. So once you get that mRNA, you got to take that mRNA and make it into protein. And the first thing we do, we make it into a long string of proteins, but then that protein has to fold to, to make whatever protein, what, whatever configuration actually works for alpha galactosidase. It so turns out some, some of these uh, Fabry mutations, the, they make the full protein, right? You make the full protein, but you don't fold right. So, um, so that's a problem. So there is now a FDA approved drug called megalostat that actually uh, reduces the energy needed for these proteins to fold. And in some amenable mutation, this is the target, right? After you get a folded protein, you get alpha galactosidase, which is the full enzyme. Well, if I intervene there, that's called enzyme replacement therapy. And currently we have uh, three enzyme replacement therapies, uh, two that are FDA approved, one that's investigational. So agalsidase alpha, um, which is uh, Replegal, which is currently FDA approved in uh, many countries, but not the United States. We have agalsidase beta, which is Fabrizyme approved in the US um, uh, as of uh, March of this year. Um, and then uh, because for the last 20 years, it has been under investigational um, uh, status. Um, or it really a phase four clinical trial. Uh, so investigational uh, is, is protalix or pegunigalsidase that is under investigation. Um, so that's one way, that's all the paths we can hit with uh, Fabry disease. Now on the other side of things, so I, I told you that the enzyme is more like the trash man. So what if I just didn't make trash, right? And so there are uh, two... Um, uh, two drugs that are under investigation currently, which is Luceristat and Menglustat. And where they work is they block the conversion of ceramide into globotriacylceramide, tri um, with the idea being maybe if I reduce the production of GB3, I could actually improve the disease. Um, and the exciting thing is that those are pills. So megalostat, which is chaperone therapy, is a pill um, uh, that can only be used in a minimal mutation, whereas luceristat and vanglustat are pills that are non-mutation non specific. Um, so more to follow on those for sure. So what do we know about enzyme replacement therapy? So Fabrizyme, currently uh, FDA approved, that was a big deal because uh, we, you know, they'd been working on this for a long time, collecting data to provide to the FDA to say, when can I get full approval? And that finally happened. Um, published this year, Ortiz et al. Um, so Alberto Ortiz, who's a nephrologist out of Spain, um, published a meta-analysis. It's hard to get data you know, for a, a disease that is this rare. So sometimes what we have to do to get the data and to get enough data, we take lots of studies, we put them together and say, can I compare these, these trials? Did similar things happen? And then we join them all together as if one trial happened, right? Uh, it's called a meta-analysis. So uh, Alberto Ortiz did this meta-analysis and showed that in, if you combine all of the studies um, that were comparable for uh, the administration of uh, Fabrizyme, there was a 2.46 to 2.64 millimeters per minute um, per 1.73 meters squared slower decline in kidney function. Now, what the heck does that mean, right? I mean, you know, we throw around these numbers, but you want to know what does this mean? I mean, is two, I mean, two is a low number. So people are like, well, what does two mean? Well, here we go. Let, let's just do some math. So you start with a patient um, who has a kidney function of 100, right? Let's make the math easy. 
I tell you that patients go on dialysis at around a GFR of 10. All right. So this patient has 90 to lose. Okay. So let's just take a patient who has pretty significant kidney loss of function, which is a GFR loss of four per year. That would be significant loss in kidney function. Then if you do that math, the patient will go on dialysis in 22.5 years, right? If that is a linear decline in kidney function of four, right? Now, what this previous study showed, right, with the meta-analysis was that we can reduce the decline of kidney function by 2.4, so, or 2.64, well, you know, somewhere in between. So if you subtract 2.64 from four, so this is the same patient losing four and you improve it by 2.64, well, now, that patient's GFR loss is 1.54 per year, and they go on dialysis in 59 years, not 22 years, right? Now, that's what that means. So even a decline in rate of loss of kidney function by one is a big deal, right? Because um, every one means a lot of, of time that I don't need to think about dialysis or transplant. So that is what we try and do is we're, we're trying to figure out what are the best ways to reduce the decline of kidney function and even small changes when you're starting early mean a big deal from uh, how long I don't have to be on dialysis. So uh, currently with Protalix, this was the bridge study that was uh, published. Um, this was a switchover study from Replegal to Protalix. All right. And so Interestingly enough, when they compared this, this was a relatively small study. Um, when they actually did the analysis, they showed that some patients actually improved kidney function. So unfortunately for, for most patients with kidney disease, we're unable to make the kidney better. What we are able to do is stop the decline. That's what we're really doing. So it was kind of interesting to see that this kidney function got better. Not only did it not get worse, it got better. Now, most of us in the field think that this, this is this was exciting. It wasn't a slam dunk because the dosing of Replegal is 0.2 to 0.4. So it's a much lower dose of enzyme. So they got 0.2 to 0.4 of Replegal versus one milligram per kilogram of Protalix. So we say, this is interesting, but all of us are awaiting uh, with fingers crossed um, the uh, results of what's called the balance trial, which was a head-to-head -head trial with Fabrizone. I think that's going to be very interesting um, uh, data that, that we will need to make uh, actually good decisions on uh, therapeutic, um, um, good therapeutic decisions. All right. So megalostat is the chaperone therapy. Now remember, chaperone therapy is a different, different bird. It's an oral pill. It only works on certain mutations. And so the, the initial study up here, which was uh, by Felt Rasmussen, um, showed that at the bare minimum, the kidney function seemed to be stable. Now, the issue is, is that uh, some amenable mutations actually have lower kidney involvement. So it, it may not be comparing apples to apples, but does seem to be stable. All right, and that's good. So hot off the presses uh, in 2021, Bichet et al. I'm going to co-author on this paper, uh, actually showed that in patients who, what they did was they took the people who were originally on the uh, megalostat trial and followed them for a duration of, uh, in most cases, up to nine years, right? So this is the long-term follow-up of patients on megalostat. Um, and they showed that the decline in EGFR was negative 0.1 or 0.1, depending on uh, male versus female. Now, this is very, very stable. The question is, what is this is, I mean, all of that is very, very encouraging. I, I guess that, that's the, the, the long shot, uh, or, or that's the long story short, which is that megalostat, at least in the patients that we were able to use it in, which in my case is only about 10% of the patients that I've identified, does seem to, to um, stabilize kidney function in patients who are amenable, and that's the key, in patients who are amenable in this group of patients, all right? Um, there are patients that we have found that are amenable that may not respond to therapy. So it's very important when you go on megalostat that you have to follow um, uh, the kidney function to make sure that uh, you are truly amenable. All right. So now the thing is that may not be enough. Um, so although Fabry specific therapies are great, this is not a one and done. I mean, everybody needs to treat their Fabry disease as a risk factor for heart disease, stroke, kidney disease, right? 
So just like risk factors for heart disease, kidney disease, and stroke, we need to do other things. We need to live healthily, right? Um, so first of all, uh, I think that I can't uh, state it enough. Everybody needs to be on a low salt diet. Definitely if you have proteinuria, but I think that, that uh, for those of us who live in the South, um, we are on the anti-low salt diet. Um, you know, unfortunately barbecue and fried chicken uh, uh, is salt heavy yet incredibly delicious. Um, so we got to make good choices for ourselves and, um, and eat low salt diets. Now, the other thing is that we found that, that in other types of kidney disease, as if we reduce the amount of protein urea uh, in the urine, we can slow the decline of kidney function. So in patients who have protein urea greater than 500 milligrams, at least, uh, you need to be on an ACE inhibitor, right? ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker. And importantly, that is irrespective of your blood pressure. So just because you don't have high blood pressure doesn't mean you don't need one of these medications because you titrate these medications to protein in the urine, not to blood pressure. Now you wanna make sure you don't overshoot, um, but these medicines protect the kidney. And finally, SGLT2 inhibitors, um, which actually made their big debut in um, uh, really October of 2019, uh, I believe. Um, uh, was it 2019 or 2020? Let me see when this was published. October, no, 2020. Oh, it's COVID. See, it's got COVID brain. All right. So this was an adjunct. So it's a very interesting molecule. So SGLT2 is the sodium glucose co-transporter in the kidney. And so where this was thought of is, well, look, if I inhibit this transporter, then patients are just going to pee out sugar and then their diabetes will get better. Well, that's what happened. So diabetes got better. It was, it was marketed as a diabetes drug. But the interesting part about this is that the kidneys got a whole lot better. So in these diabetics, diabetics is the leading cause of kidney disease and, and patients going on dialysis in the country. And sure enough, uh, kidneys got better. So they got so better that, that they decided to say, well, what if I use this drug in non-diabetic kidney disease, right? So I'm just going to take people with protein in the urine and I'm going to put them on this and see if they get better, irrespective of if they have diabetes or not. And sure enough, uh, the patients who got this did better. Um, so this is a New England Journal trial um, showing that the, the renal survival with dapoflagosin, um, <coughs> which is a drug called Farxiga, um, uh, actually improved. And so now what our regimen is, is that if you have, so we do Fabrase specific therapy. If you have proteinuria greater than 500 milligrams, you go on an ACE inhibitor. We titrate that up. And if you still have proteinuria that we cannot manage, then I add an SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, so you know, we try and hit it at all pathways to try and re reduce um, the amount of proteinuria. All right. So some new things in diagnoses. Um, you know, we've spent the last, uh, I don't know, uh, 20 years trying to convince doctors that they need to know about February disease, but it's been kind of a losing battle. I mean, it's been, it's been great, but by and large, uh, we stumble upon the diagnoses um, and there's still a whole lot of patients out there that are undiagnosed. So I'm really excited about gene panels. So gene panels are finally bringing uh, genetic testing into the realm of the possibility. Because before, uh, I don't know, through about six or seven years ago, I'd say a patient needs genetic testing and it would be $3,000 for one gene. Three genes would be $9,000. And by the time you got to three, three genes, um, uh, then um, whatchamacallit, by the time you got to three genes, then you do whole exome sequencing. But gene panels are really making this uh, a reality. All right, so telemedicine, we talked about telemedicine. I think this is important for February patients um, because you know, about nine years ago, I gave a talk about making uh, regional centers of expertise for rare disease um, because not everybody is interested in February. And I think everybody should have the, the opportunity to talk with somebody who really uh, dedicates themselves to, um, uh, to the rare disease. Um, so hopefully with telehealth, we'll have more centers of excellence that can span the entire country so that nobody is without access. So that's, that's it. Uh, so kidney function needs to be monitored on a yearly basis. You need to know your kidney function. You need to know if it's declining. I would graph it out um, so you can show people. 
uh, kidney biopsies are useful. And now there's a lot of things we can do to prevent the, uh, the kidney function decline um, in February patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Wallace. Um, if you have questions, please put them in your chat box, either to, uh, to everyone or to Dr. Wallace. I see we have one question so far, which says, can you talk a little more about the alteration in sleep cycle in relation to kidney function? Yeah, that's, so that's a good question. So the alteration in the sleep cycle, so let me, let me preface this, which is that we were born with way more kidney than we ever needed. Um, uh, that's why I can take a kidney out of someone, i.e. a living donor, and they do better than the general population, right? Um, so what I usually tell people is that, uh, you know, your kidney can pretty much do the job it needs to with a kidney function of 30 or greater, right? So anything over 30 is gravy, right? That's, that's your reserve. Um, now, between 10 and 30, there's some issues, minor issues that we got to address. And 10, you go on dialysis. So that's, that's a rough, you know, give or take five, right? All right. So now here's the issue. So what happens with uh, the sleep cycle is the sleep cycle that we know happens in kidney disease happens relatively late. So we're talking about GFRs of around 20. Um, but when you get GFRs of 20, uh, sleep cycle gets gets messed up and it gets messed up for a couple of reasons. Number one is the toxins that are not getting out of the body. Number two, there's a much higher incidence of restless leg um, at, in patients with kidney disease. Um, and that largely has to do with metabolism of iron because patients with significant, with, we're talking chronic kidney disease stage four, which is uh, uh, GFR of 30 or less, um, have a, an inability to absorb iron from the gut. So they get more and more iron deficient. Iron deficiency leads to uh, restless leg syndrome. So there's a lot of reasons why sleep cycle actually gets uh, messed up. Um, but the, the primary ones is usually happens uh, under a GFR of 30. Great, thank you. Um, any nutraceuticals or other ways to improve kidney function, reverse damage, such as AC, a NAC or L-arginine? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think there's a lot that's been going on with antioxidants. Um, you know, so reactive oxygen species um, can lead to ki can lead to kidney disease. So antioxidants, I think, are are important. Um, the L-arginine is interesting, um, and the reason L-arginine is interesting, it has a lot of uses. Um, you know, it was L-arginine for those of you who don't know is an amino acid. Um, that gets metabolized into nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator, um, and actually relaxes smooth muscle. So one of the primary things, I've had patients that, that nothing worked for their reflux um, until they started doing L-arginine. This is in Fabre patients. So I know Fabre patients have a, a, a lot of reflux and GI issues, and L-arginine is one way that you can address that right? And the way it works, it relaxes smooth muscle, which is in the esophagus. The reason L-arginine is kind of questionable in kidney is that it may make your kidney number look good, but it may not be helping the kidney. And the reason is, what well, all it does is it actually dilates the arteries and increases blood flow to the kidney. You think that's good, but it actually may overwork the kidney. So there's something called hyperfiltration. So if you deliver more blood to the kidney, that's more blood it has to filter. So the creatinine is going to go down, but then long-term that may not be a good idea. And I'll give you one of the best examples is diabetes. So in diabetes, what happens is before the kidney starts getting worse very quickly, the creatinine goes down and you say, hey, yay, the kidney's getting better. But for nephrologists, if you have a diabetic who's steady, steady, and then the kidney drops, you say they're hyperfiltering, they're about to get, get worse. So I do not know of any studies that have suggested that long-term L-arginine is actually good for the kidney. Um, and there's probably reason to suspect that long-term it may not be the best, but reactive oxygen, I, I think uh, things like um, uh, antioxidants are probably uh, some of the ones that I would say have the, the best shot. Avoiding drugs is also really important. Um, so, you know, avoiding things like, um, Aristolochia. Uh, Aristolochia is a, an herb. Um, it is used in, in Chinese uh, medicine. Actually, it was called Chinese herb nephropathy can happen with aristolochic acid. 
Um, so from, uh, from that standpoint, there are some herbs to, uh, and natural medicines that you want to avoid. Um, but that's, and where there's, a, I could, I could talk for a long time about, uh, a lot of this stuff. Um, but so, so, but a great question. Great, thanks. Um, will they do a trial in kids for the Protalix drug soon? We'd have to ask Protalix. Um, I have no idea. Uh, I hope so. Uh, you know, I, I, you, but I guess, you know, I, I think about things as a dad, right? Um, you know, as a dad, what we always want to do is we want to make sure that, that we are as safe as possible, right? Um, and that we don't do any undue risk to children. So, I would think that if I were an FDA and I had this balance trial that was out there, that I'd want the results of the balance trial. And if the balance trials were positive, then I'd say, why don't we try it in kids? If the balance positive trial was negative, then I'd say, why risk kids, right? So, so I don't know. I didn't just we'll see. It's up to it's up to Protalix to decide in the FDA. But but you know, that's how I address clinical trials in general. Would say, would I enroll my own child in it? Um, will you explain bun slash creatinine ratio? Can you have a good creatinine and GFR and then a poor bun ratio? And if so, what could cause this? Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, well, I need to enroll you for, for nephrology. Um, so BUN uh, is, is a fascinating thing. It's, it's actually blood urea nitrogen. Um, and it turns out that all that protein we eat are made of amino acids. Amino acids have an amine group, which is NH, right? That's nitrogen, N is nitrogen, and a carboxyl group, which is COOH. You don't have to know that, but it's the amine group that actually can be toxic, right? So in our liver, we have something called transaminases. Trans meaning remove, amine means the amine group, right? We have a whole lot of these transaminases, right? ALT and AST are what we measure in, in liver, sorry, in the blood to see if the liver is going bad because we have so much of those transaminases. So what happens is, is that your body, you eat protein, it gets delivered to the liver. Liver takes off the amine group, but it can't leave it like that because it's toxic. So your body developed this whole system called the RIA cycle to just link those two together. So it puts two amine groups, one amine group and another links it together and they call it BUN. BUN goes into the blood, it's not toxic, and then you pee it out right? So that's BUN. So the reason that you can actually have a very high BUN with normal creatinine and normal kidney function is actually if, um, for a couple of reasons, and all of them, almost all of them have to do with increasing protein delivery to the gut, right? Because if I increase protein delivery to the gut, then guess what? I deaminate a whole lot of amino acids, the BUN goes up, and my kidney hasn't had time to pee it out, right? So TPN, so total parental nutrition, steroids. Uh, steroids is probably one of the most common because steroids like prednisone, not anabolic steroids, like not, not those, but prednisone actually causes cells to break down. When cells break down, it delivers more protein to the liver. You get high BUN. Um, so there are definitely ways you can have a high BUN. Actually, the most common of all is dehydration because um, all that means is that your kidney works normal. If you had more water, you could flush the BUN out. So if your BUN to creatinine ratio is greater than 20, um, first thing we do is hydrate you. The next thing we do is we say, well, what else is going on, right? Which is protein, steroids, uh, blood in the gut, uh, and actually some of the minocycline, which is antibiotics can do it for unknown reasons. So anyway, lots of things, but yes, your answer, we can have a high BUN uh, with a normal creatinine. Uh, next question, endothelial dysfunction or inflammation reductions, are there endothelial dysfunction or inflammation reduction solutions that can support or help kidney, heart, heart and brain in February? That is a good question. We know the endothelium is involved heavily. In fact, you know, um, most of our ERTs got FDA approved, right, because they showed a clearance of the endothelial cell, right? Um, so aside from that, you know, all of this, I guess I'm going to tell you that, you know, the scientific answer is we don't have data, right? I mean, we have, we struggle getting data in, uh, uh, you know, diabetes trials where there are hundreds of thousands of patients. 
uh, trying to get these trials, uh, even for the ones that we have. So uh, for, for this type of question is, is tough. So I guess the long and short of it is potentially, I mean, it would make sense that if you had something that would affect endothelial function, specifically a fenestrated endothelium, that it, it should improve things. Uh, we just don't have any, any data. Um, so you know, the stuff that we talked about, we have data for the uh, low sodium diet, et cetera. So anything like that would be on top of the basics, right? Um, and I think, unfortunately, what what sometimes we do, we're in a weird place in healthcare right now. I think healthcare has lost a lot of trust. Um, but what we need to do is, is we need to say, let's do the basics and then add that on top of a low salt diet, ACE inhibitor, SGLT2, and a February specific therapy, right? Then we can add on. Sounds good. Um, there's a comment. I'm very new to Fabre, but recently I did a microalbumin urine test. The result was 38.8 and high, uh, but it says normal is under 30. Can you tell where I stand now for kidney function? No, and that's a good question. And the reason is, is that the microalbumin alone is, is not usually what we get. I'm sorry, it is what we get, but what you need to do is you need to normalize it to creatinine. So usually what we do is we get an albumin to creatinine ratio and then see where that is, right? Because a 38, if your excretion of creatinine is high, that could be normal, right? Even though the, the value says H, right? It, it, it may be normal depending on your excretion of creatinine. So we normalize it. And what you want to know, ask your doctor what your ACR, albumin to creatinine ratio is. Um, that is what we, we analyze, right? Um, but in general, if you have protein in the urine, a lot of patients in Fabry disease, it sounded like they caught you early, right? I mean, in general, because 38 is still not that high. So, but if the, your albumin to creatinine ratio is high, your kidney function be, could be stone cold normal. Usually we get the proteinuria before the kidney function starts to decline. So now's the time to start addressing that. Um, and, and start some of these therapies that we discussed so that your kidney function doesn't decline, right? So think of uh, the creatinine and the GFR is, is your kidney function where it is. The proteinuria is how fast it's going to decline. So that leads really nicely into the next question, which is my nephrologist focuses on albumin to creatinine ratio and protein to creatinine ratio as measures of kidney health in the urine as much as serum creatinine and GFR, why are they significant? Right. Sorry, I was reading. Oh, all right. My focus on albumin creatinine and protein creatinine as measures of kidney health. Yeah, so it, it's very significant. Um, and the reason is, first of all, that's what we're addressing with our therapy. So we've shown that if we can, if we can decrease the protein in the urine, to less than 500 milligrams, your kidney function will decline slower than if we leave it at 500 milligrams, right? So it's actually addressing the problem, right? The protein in the urine is a symptom of the problem. The problem is the filter. We need to address the filter. So as soon as people start getting proteinuria, we need to address it. Um, it turns out that, well, probably for, for nephrology fellows, which is that, by the time you get protein in the toilet, your kidney has already reabsorbed a lot of that protein. So protein in the toilet that looks like it's small is just kind of think about it at the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more protein that, that actually tried to get to the toilet, just didn't make it. Um, so, so it is very important, not as a marker of kidney function, but as a marker of how fast am I going to lose kidney function in the future? Higher the protein, faster the decline is going to be. So if you address the protein, slower the decline. All right. So my daughter who has, oh, go ahead. You want to read it? No, you can read it. Oh, my daughter who has had fibroid disease, had protein in her blood before pregnancy. She had severe kidney problems, preeclampsia. My wife had preeclampsia too. Um, uh, her protein levels are now back to her earlier levels. Does pregnancy cause long-term kidney issues for fibroid patients? And the answer is, all we can say, uh, it's not really a Fabry thing. Let's just talk about this in kidney disease, all right, which is that if you start 
pregnancy with protein in the urine, um, the kidney hyperfilters during pregnancy. So the kidney says, hey, wait, I got to filter blood for two. So it starts hyperfiltering. Hyperfiltering is never a good thing, right? So long term, so the New England Journal paper showed that of patients who entered pregnancy with chronic kidney disease, two thirds ended the pregnancy with worse kidney function, right? So in general, uh, for anybody with longstanding chronic kidney disease who enters pregnancy, uh, about two thirds are gonna leave it with a little bit worse kidney function. But what you're telling me is that it looks like she was one of the few that actually the one third that ended kidney, um, ended pregnancy and her kidney function improved, proteinuria got back to, to the basic levels but you want to treat the proteinuria long-term. Now, the reason that, that her proteinuria also got worse, I'm gonna venture a guess, which is that most of our patients who have proteinuria are on ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers to reduce that protein. Well, during pregnancy, you have to stop those drugs. So the proteinuria gets worse and you hyperfilter and you have the high blood pressure. So it, it can be a double whammy. Um, preeclampsia specifically, when we go back to the other question, is a problem with endothelial function, um, which also affects the kidney. So anyway, lots of things going on, but I'm glad she returned back to normal. Need to address the proteinuria. Looks like one last question. Uh, to increase or stop kidney function issues, are there, uh, is there anything other than low sodium diet? Is it better to cut out meat or fish or and fish? Now, that's an interesting question as well. So, you know, this is, so we just said that protein actually leads to higher BUN. So for a while there, um, uh, so with our, our cirrhotics and our, our kidney function, when I say for a while, this was in the 40s and 50s, everybody said, hey, you're going to do great. We're going to protein starve you, right? So you have kidney disease. You know, they didn't have dialysis. You couldn't fix that. So they just cut out protein altogether. And lo and behold, the BUN got a whole lot better. Um, unfortunately, the patients didn't do better because we starve them, right? I mean, so they got malnourished. So uh, I guess the long story short, what we usually recommend for people is I wouldn't, I wouldn't need a high protein diet, meaning if you, if you, before having Fabry disease, if you drank protein shakes, uh, like they were going out of style because you were a bodybuilder, that's probably not good for the kidney, right? And so we want to limit protein to a normal level, but I don't want to restrict it to a level that's so low um, that you end up being malnourished. Now, clearly there are people that eat no protein diets, right? Uh, so, uh, well, lower protein diets, specifically vegan, they get their protein in different, um, uh, in different forms. Um, so you need to eat enough protein to maintain your, um, your nutritional status. Uh, so most of my patients eat meat. Um, they just don't do the steak every day. All right. Uh, quick question. What's the best way to reach you for telehealth? Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the whatchamacallit, the, my contact information is on the website, um, but I'm only licensed right now in three states. So it's, and telehealth, it makes it, makes it seem, I mean, theoretically, I could see, I could see someone anywhere, but medical state licensure prevents me from seeing anybody who is not in a state that I am licensed. So currently I'm only licensed in Alabama, uh, Mississippi and Florida working on Tennessee. So if you aren't in those, those cities, you would have to drive into one of those states to see me, which is anyway, some of these regulations are crazy, but that is, that's what it is. All right. Um, uh, so on our website, if you, if you go to www.fabrodisease.org, and you scroll down probably two thirds of the way down in one of the four, there's several lines of four program blocks. You'll see one that says, find a specialist. And, uh, and then you click the button that says, um, whatever it says, find a specialist, it says something short. <laughs> and then you can go in there and there's a, 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 not a rotary wheel, but a linear wheel, a linear, um, selection box that you can select the first letter of the state. So you select Alabama and you'll find Dr. Wallace and you go to so right at the moment, select Florida and Mississippi and find the same information. So you can find the phone number easily that way. Thank you. 
All right, I'm going to stick it in the comments as well. So you can have it there. Um, here's another question. What if someone, hold on, let me just jump it up. What if someone is aggressively trying to stop or reverse kidney problems using non-traditional methods? Is there something out there in different silos, grass, RX, FDA, awful bowl, natural herb, that can be utilized with a compounding pharmacy? Yeah, I mean, potentially, I just don't know the data. Um, and you know, the, the one thing is that unless you're, everything is possible, right? Um, but unless you're actually addressing the underlying cause, so if you told me that there was a, a natural thing out there that stopped globotriacylceramide from building up, um, then that would be something that I would I would look at. But if you're trying to use non-traditional ways on their own to stop kidney function in a disease that has a clear cause, um, then like I said, I would use the traditional and then use these on top of, um, because you know I'm 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 always willing for help, but we got to do at, at least we usually start with the the thing we have the most data on. Um, here's a patient who says I had a kidney biopsy two years ago for high levels of protein in my urine. It came back as classic Fabrays, but it's not detected in the blood for gene testing, and have not started any therapy. Any suggestions? Yeah, and actually, Don may be the best one to answer this. Um, but you know what? What we would do first. I mean, it's it's really fascinating. I have one of these patients as well, and we have done everything. The biopsy is classic. We've done everything. Um, but the first thing is that uh, most providers who are just starting with genetics, like me, you know, eight years ago, would just send the gene, and if negative, you say, okay, it's not that. That's not true. There's two other tests that need to be sent at the bare minimum, which is a deletion and duplication studies, right? So that has to be sent uh, as well. The next thing that also needs to be done is let's, let's forget if your kidney biopsy is classic, I'd like to know your alpha galactosidase enzyme activity level, right? Because irrespective of the, if the genetics are there, if you have a deficiency in alpha galactosidase enzyme, uh, that's probably enough to start treatment. The insurance company are going to want something, right? So, so you know, needs to be something. And then finally, if if there was just nothing else we could do, um, the next there is one other thing that that somebody could do. So, you know, here would be my progression for you, which would be deletion, duplication studies, alpha galactosis enzyme. I'd send those all at once. If all of those were normal, um, then I would look at the kidney biopsies to say, is there tissue that I can send for mass spectrometry to say? If those are not GB3, because that's what you're looking at, um, what are they? There are other diseases, or when I say uh, there are other diseases and other drugs that can cause things that look like classic Fabre, specifically chloroquine, um, hydroxychloroquine, amiodarone are the top three drugs that, uh, and genomycin that actually can cause these things that look like Fabre disease, but it's not. So uh, if it's not GB3, then you say, what other sphingomyelin or sphingol, uh, sphingolipid is it, right? And you can only get that through using very, very specific uh, uh, techniques for lipid isolation and mass spectrometry. I think, does anybody else have a question? That may be it. And it's good timing because we're just at the, the top of the hour. So that looks really good. So thanks. Well, Ross for all of his excellent insights and a great lecture. Yes, Dr. Ross, thank you very much. A great presentation. Thank you, Don. Um, Don, if you would like to uh, ask everyone to put the prize drawing answer in the chat box, and this is for people with Fabre family members and caregivers. So if you are a family member or a caregiver, please put telehealth in the comments and we will do a drawing to see who wins a prize. So just telehealth, type it in there. And while you're doing that, I'll mention that uh, I didn't notice as I was talking about how to reach Dr. Wallace that Dawn put the information in the chat box. So uh, she's a much better uh, multitasker than I am. So I wasn't surprised to look up and see it when I was done talking. So but thank you, Dawn. Thank All you. Right. You guys have a great day. So while you're putting your answers in the chat box, we can, uh, Brittany can, um, start working on uh, who the winner is through the random number generator. I will, if uh, 
I will share my slides and do a quick, a uh, few quick announcements and then we'll be finished for the night. Let me just uh, reduce this screen. I'm opening up my presentation so that I can share it. So while Jerry is opening up his presentation, the winner of the drawing is Randall Croch, Croch, Croch. Randall, congratulations. <laughs> the winner is who again? Randall. Randall. Yep. Great. All right, congratulations. We'll get you a uh, Amazon gift card in the uh, mail. I just have to find the, uh, get my screen enough out of the way that I can find the share screen. Apologize for the delay, it just always takes me a minute. Here we go. All right, can you see my screen? Don, can you see my screen? Yep, looks great. Great, all right. We put it in, um, seem to have windows popping up in front of what I'm trying to get to. All right. Okay, so every time we have a meeting, we take the opportunity to let you know what's going on in uh, industry. And so that uh, you'll be aware of, of if maybe if you don't remember all the things we will talk about, it's brief anyway, I'll show you where to find it. So all of our sponsors um, that help us put provide programs, we and um, any opportunities of anything that's going on in industry like you to know about so that you can participate if something is appropriate for you. So starting at the top, and we, these are just highlights. And uh, so Santa Fe Genzyme um, has various websites that they'd like you to be aware of. And also they just started a new study called the Fabry disease, the FD proof study. So you can, I'll show you, you can, so you can go back to this screen when, you, when we share the recording and just stop it on this screen and get the information off it. And I'll show you another place you can find uh, similar information. So Amicus is the same. They have their uh, website that would like everyone to know about. Casey um, has the Rethink uh, Fabric website and they have a webinar series. Um, and the next webinar is November 30th. Avro Bio is still enrolling uh, participants in their study. And you know, I put the uh, clinical trial site up on the on the announcements page. Sangamo is also uh, still doing their clinical trial and enrolling patients, and they just put out a new re news release that you can uh, see the link from. Adorcia has been uh, finished recruitment for quite a long time, and we're all just waiting results of the of their uh, clinical trial for. So I think you already know this, but. Uh, Santa Fe Genzyme, of course, is ERT, Fabrizyme. Amicus is, uh, is a chaperone therapy. Um, Megalostat, Chiesi is this, another ERT that's pending, pending approval. Everbio, Sang Sangamo, and 4DMT and Freeline at the bottom um, are all gene therapy uh, studies. And then Adorcia is the substrate reduction therapy that uh, Dr. Wallace talked about. So Adorcia is uh, finished enrolling, but still working on a, a, a possible approval. And 4DMT and Freeline also have their clinical trials started. And in addition to the ones, the uh, industry companies that Dr. Wallace mentioned for um, gene therapy, there are also, um, I wrote it down. Oh, I see. I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget when I want to talk about them. There are Freeline. MP6, which stands for mono six M6P, which stands for mono six fat phosphate. If you uh, know any of the science, Unicure, Codexis, Sigalon, um, are all gene therapy, um, or, or at some stage of gene therapy um, treatment. Um, so, Jerry, there's two updates um, to the list that just came out. One is that the modified, the first set of modified data was put to the FDA from my DORSA, and the FDA said they want additional data. Um, okay. It's the endpoint they were looking at, which was pain. 
And then for for DMT just did a press release about I think their first three patients as well. So I think right. for DMT and Sangamo did press releases uh, right. both early. Yeah. So you can just see a couple updates. DMT, um, press release on our Facebook page, but it's not up on the website yet. So, but uh, we'll work on keeping updating the thing, updating those those things. Thanks, Don. And, it changes uh, fast. <laughs> so, whoops. Next show you how to get to some of these. So on our website, if you look on the top menu bar, you'll see the tab for company, company and uh, clinic info. Then you can select pharma, clinic, or support. And if you look in the pharma industry tab uh, first, you can see each block for each company and has a read more um, button at the bottom. You go in each company and there's a list of the resources and links, um, P PDFs, videos, websites that they'd like you to see. So there's more information on what the company resources are. If you go into the, I didn't put the clinic uh, picture up here, but this is the support org tab on the right. If you go into the middle block for the NFTF, it lists all of the videos for the 200, 2021 video series. So you can see all of the links to see all the videos. They're also up on our YouTube channel and they're also up on the registration website in the archives recording tab. So there's three ways you can get to the videos for all the meetings that we've done so far. And this video will be up in a couple of days. So we still have calendars left. The calendars run through April. So there's still about five, a little more than five months on them. So if you'd like a calendar, calendar and you don't have one, please email me. And last, uh, as we have done in the past, now that we're finished, the register here link will go away. The recording will come up on the, um, the uh, archives and recording site and we'll make the next meeting, which is nutrition for fabric disease on November 17th. Um, we'll make that uh, register um, here link active. So we'll see you all at the next uh, meeting. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Brittany. And thank you all. Good night.